Hold your breath. Make a wish. Count to three. Hi, and welcome back to the channel. The beard's growing back slowly, but steadily. So all is well with the world. Let's talk about movie flops because they're kind of interesting. Movie flops are something that's only ever said about really large movies. Nobody says that a $5 million mumblecore movie that is shown at Sundance Film Festival is a flop. It's always really, really big films. Now, here's the thing. It doesn't matter to you or I if a movie is a flop. Not one tiny bit. Unless you have shares in Disney or Sony or one of the other big movie companies, unless you have points in the movie, unless your dearest friend is in the movie, it doesn't really matter if it's a flop. What matters is if you enjoy the film. So in that spirit of not giving a stuff about somebody else's wealth, let's talk about 10 movie flops that are really entertaining. So let's get started with 1971 and a movie that we all love. And if you don't love it, you're dead in the heart. A little film based on a Roald Dahl story. Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. This is my 4K. It's the very first 4K I bought. And there are reasons. It's an eminently rewatchable film. It's a lot of fun. Gee Wilder's best role. Not too keen on Grandpa Joe because I think he's a bit of a slacker. Music by Leslie Brickus. And it's a delight front to end. But it wasn't successful. That's the weird thing. $2 million budget, it only made $3 million. And you've got to remember that the way that economics works in Hollywood. Unless you double your money, you haven't made a profit. Now, I don't know why it's like that. Probably greed and neoliberalist capitalism. But that's the fact. So Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory didn't make big bucks. And so, so they didn't make a sequel where the little kid gets diabetes. And years later, they find that fat kid in the tubing. And there's a, suddenly a murder mystery on their hands. None of that ever happened because of that. I'm going to ignore the Tim Burton remake because it was abysmal and really tone deaf to the things people liked about this version. I watched that one one and I probably won't watch it again. There's not enough lifespan left for me to want to see that. But this one's pretty good. It's got special, tons of special features and what's not to love? But it was a flop. So purely in the terms of Hollywood, it wasn't successful. In the terms of millions and millions of children's hearts, it was a success. So this one's a little bit of a deep cut. 1999. John McTinn and the guy who directed Die Hard and who has since been in and out of trouble made a movie which was supposedly guaranteed to be a success. It was based on a Michael Crichton novel. Uh, Michael Crichton, of course, was flavour of the month ever since Jurassic Park came out in 92. So they thought they would throw some money at this. And how much did they throw at it? So the studio threw $160 million at this one and it only made 61.7 million. So by anyone's criteria, um, that one wasn't successful. A little film with Antonio Banderas called The 13th Warrior. Now this one's pretty good. It's set in the 10th century when Arabic civilization was much more further advanced than European civilization. An Arabic scholar played by Antonio Banderas. And you can argue whether Antonio Banderas is appropriate casting or not. So you've got to remember, Antonio Banderas is Spanish, and there is Moorish blood in Spain because of the occupation by the Moors that happened and caused crusades and things like that. Not too big on that part of the history, but you know what I mean. So this scholar gets to be an emissary to the Volga Bulgars in um, kind of Eastern Europe and gets involved with a mission to go north and fight some monsters that one of the kingdoms up north is fighting cannibalistic rapacious monsters who are incredibly good strategists and who live on a mountain that's covered in eternal fog now whether they're cannibalistic humans whether they're chuds whether they're neanderthals or whether they're denisovans we don't know and it doesn't really matter all we know is that they are really nasty pieces of work and 13 warriors including our titular arabic scholar 
go up the mountain to fight these creatures. Now, it's a good little action film. People have given it a lot of shit, but I like it. It's got a pretty good cast, too. Tony Curran's in it playing one of the Northmen who's set up to fight these guys. You've got Omar Sharif in there as well. And I think it's a bit underrated because I, I like the concept. It probably wasn't right for being made in 1999 having an uh, Islamic protagonist at a time when tensions were high two years before 9-11. Not really the best timing, but it's a good solid story. And the creatures they find are really, really nasty. If you've seen Bone Tomahawk, think about those guys. Not too dissimilar. But I like this one. And I first time I saw it, I didn't like it that much. Second time I saw it, I liked it a lot more. So it's worth checking out The 13th Warrior because it's a solid action film and I like what it does. That brings us to 2008 and a movie that did not do well at all. Let's have a look at the numbers on this one. $200 million budget, made $93 million. So again, another financial success, but it's a spectacularly beautiful film based on an IP that I really like because I watched the IP when I was a kid. And it's the Wachowskis with Speed Racer. Now, I think I might have talked about Speed Racer once before, but I like it a lot. It's got this beautiful way of merging live-action characters played by Emile Hirsch and Christina Ricci and Susan Sarandon and John Goodman, amongst other people, with animated backgrounds and, and a, basically a, a green screen world. And they do it seamlessly. I think this is the first movie where I really noticed that you can create a fantastical world that's very, very stylized, very abstract, and yet populate it with people who feel like they live there. I think that that's the big takeaway from this one. And it's a lot of fun. Um, it looks beautiful. The action is filmed fantastically. The world and the transitions and, and the way that the Wachowskis use the screen. This is the Wachowskis having fun and not taking themselves too seriously while taking the work seriously. And uh, I find this one rewatchable as well. And again, that's one of my new criteria for whether a film is good, whether you can watch it, say, once a year and still get enjoyment from it. And this one definitely does that. I like it. It's beautiful to look at. The bigger screen you can watch it on, the better. But if you can't watch it on a big screen, that's okay too. But Speed Racer. Now, again, this was another big failure from 2012, 10 years ago. It made $208 million on a $307 million budget. And it was so spectacularly unsuccessful for Disney that there was a book written about it by Michael D. Sellers, which is really worth checking out if you can. John Carter. Now, this says the 3D version, but I've also got a 2D version on it because I didn't jump on the 3D bandwagon with the fancy glasses and the really expensive blu-ray players wasn't really my thing but this is a triple play 3d blu-ray blu-ray and a digital copy i never bothered with the digital copy on it but i like it i mean it's a little bit of a problematic film in the sense that making a film based on a hundred year old intellectual property that only geeks my age had ever read was always going to be a, a big ask i mean there have been attempts to make this since the 1930s when there were some test animations done to make a uh, animated John Carter movie. But this kind of worked for me. I think that Taylor Kitsch and Lynn Collins are great as the protagonists, John Carter and Deja Thoris, the Princess of Mars. But I like Willem Dafoe playing one of the big thugs, the, the big Martian guys. I like the world it creates. I like the unreality of him jumping around madly and almost with the same jump reach as the Hulk. I can kind of buy that in this movie. It looks beautiful. It stretched what special effects were able to achieve. And again, many of these unsuccessful films did that. They, they used computer generated effects beyond the current state of the art and fell down because of that. I mean, Ang Lee's Hulk did the same thing. But John Carter's worth rewatching and it, would, it was never gonna be made into a series really because the later books were not great and in fact Edgar Rice Burroughs books in general are not works of enormous literary merit but this one it's worth re-watching and it's a bit of fun and yeah three discs hang on yeah there is three discs 
there's these um and this one too is uh region free which is surprising because it came from disney but i've got the blu-ray there i've got uh di the digital copy for some reason the digital copy comes on a disc go figure and i've got the 3d blu-ray on it as well but um yeah worth checking out now that brings me to one i haven't got a copy of but i think i will get a copy of it's another disney film made in 2015 uh, made for $209 million, and, uh, no, made $209 million on a $190 million budget, which by Disney logic is a failure. Made by Brad Bird, who made The Incredibles, amongst other things, and I think The Iron Giant. And it's a movie called Tomorrowland with George Clooney and Hugh Laurie in it. And to be honest, I think that this movie failed for one simple reason. It's an unashamedly utopian science fiction movie about a, a little... A, kid who in 1964 was sent to an alternate universe where science and technology are far advanced on our own he then came back to our world and got miserable and then in the modern times a teenage girl whose father's a nasa engineer who's just been laid off because nasa is dying finds one of the tomorrowland badges to let her access this alternate world and she recruits george clooney's character to go back to that world with her and try to kick start the love of science and technology that she has but that our world seems to have lost and when they get back there things aren't quite what they seem but it's a great film i like the optimism and utopianism of it but it came out in 2015 where everybody was looking at dystopian hellscapes and everybody was miserable about the future and miserable about the possibilities of technology used well and so it went contrary to the zeitgeist but i like what it does i like the use of special effects in it it's got a kind of naive old-fashioned optimism about it that really didn't play well to people who wanted you know really miserable movies like the road for their entertainment but i, I think it's a much better movie than it was ever given credit for this one was not a success and it surprised me that it wasn't it made $167 million on a $185 million budget. Directed by one of the great fun action directors of our age. And it was a reboot of a movie only made five years before. I'm talking, of course, about James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. DC intellectual property. A lot of fun. Much, much better than David Ayer's version from five years before which not only um, it did introduce us to Harley Quinn, but it had a really crummy third act and the e big evil wasn't really something we had not seen before. It also has the problem of giving us Jared Leto as the Joker. And as the Joker, Jared Leto makes Cesar Romero look like Heath Ledger. Um, this is the, ext the extended cut. Why do I get the extended cut? But anyway, back to this one. I like this one. I like the bait and switch that James Gunn does at the start of the film. I like the characters in it as well. John Cena's Peacemaker, who gets his redemption arc in his own TV series, his own streaming series, sorry. Later on, you've got Idris Elba proving that he's one of the coolest actors at the moment. You've got Daniela Melchior playing Ratcatcher 2, and she gets some really nice character beats in there. You get David Dasmalchian playing the polka dot man who's kind of a, a joke villain up until this point and ends up being one of the most poignant characters in the movie and you get Nanoe played or well, voiced by Sylvester Stallone now Sylvester Stallone hasn't done a lot of great stuff lately but this is definitely one of them it's a roller coaster ride it gives us one of the original Justice League antagonists in Starro the Conqueror for the Suicide Squad to fight. Of course, it's got Viola Davis playing Amanda Waller, and who else can play Amanda Waller these days except Viola Davis? But yeah, it wasn't a success, but it's still a good, solid, watchable movie, and one of the better DC adaptations of later times. I'm still going to see Black Adam soon, so we'll see how that one goes. But Suicide Squad, rewatchable. Next cab off the rank, as we say. This one is a deep cut from 1964, directed by Anthony Mann, produced by Samuel Bronston, who was a big producer of epic films at the time. 
and oddly enough was the nephew of Leon Trotsky. This film got a big boost when Martin Scorsese did a documentary in which he said why he liked this film. So on that basis I got it and I enjoyed it. The Fall of the Roman Empire which has got a great cast. It's got Stephen Boyd, Christopher Plummer, Sophia Loren, Alec Guinness is in there, Anthony Quayle's in there. It's about the year 180 AD and a pivot point in the fall of the Roman Empire. It's not about the Roman Empire collapsing. That took hundreds of years to happen. But it's about the pivot point where the Roman Empire went from being successful to taking that first step on the wrong path. In 180 AD, the Germanic tribes were attacking Rome from the north, and there were a lot of political problems in Rome. They were flipping emperors left and right, and, and things just weren't going well. And there were a lot of people who were out for themselves. There were a lot of parallels between this movie and a lot of the problems the USA and the UK are having. In fact, they're terrifyingly parallel but this one looks great the enormous sets and the enormous set pieces in this work and yet it's a kind of elegiac melancholy film which talks to the aspirations that people have for their own culture and their own civilization and what happens when the wrong people get hold of the reins and start steering that civilization and those people on a on a downward path Really worth checking out this one because it really is great. Uh, Umbrella put this out, so you should be able to go to uh, Umbrella Entertainment and find a copy of it. This one's Region B. The movie's quite long. It's 185 minutes. But it's one you might want to check out because I think that it's underestimated. And when I watched it, I was surprised at how much I liked it. Now, while we're in the 1960s, let's look at a 2015 film set in the 1960s. It made back $75 million on a $109.8 million budget, directed by Guy Ritchie, based on a 50-year-old intellectual property at the time, The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Now, leaving aside the fact that Army Hammer, one of the two stars he plays, Ilya Kuryakin in the movie, is a guy who has fantasies of cannibalism, which left a bad taste in my mouth, uh, this one's fun. It, it's got a good cast in it, generally. Henry Cavill playing Napoleon Solo is a good piece of casting and the interesting thing is he gives a bit of a backstory which fleshes out the character wonderfully. Alicia Vikander plays a, a girl called Gabby who's from Eastern Europe and ends up helping the guys. You've got Elizabeth Debicki playing one of the villains. You've got Hugh Grant playing Mr. Waverley which works really well and the one of the great things I love about this there are two great things I love about this movie. First one is the action set pieces are on a human scale. They're not enormous, bombastic things like a superhero movie is. They're very much on a human scale, and even though there is a bit of daring do and a bit of unlikely action, Guy Ritchie does the smart thing of keeping it in proportion to the characters. And I think that that's very much something that I like about it. The other thing I love about it is it's filmed, it's set mostly in Italy, which is groovy. Italy in the 1960s, La Dolce Vita. It's got a little bit of the feel of Dino Risi's Il Sorpasso, which is a movie you should see if you have it. And the movie also has some really great Italian pop song needle drops from the 1960s. Things like uh, people like Luigi Tenco that nobody knows about who doesn't speak Italian. But the needle drops really add to the atmosphere in a wonderful way. And I like it for that. I'm going to re-watch this one soon. Just because it's a movie that I enjoy. And I like the style of it. And the, the needle drops on the soundtrack are really, really, really well chosen. That then brings us to a vulgar pleasure I've enjoyed since it first came out in the 1990s. 1991. Let's see what the numbers are on this one. Made 107... Sorry, made 17 million dollars on a 65 million dollar budget it went over budget a couple of times directed by michael lemon uh hudson hook bruce willis danny aiello um, it's got andy mcdowell playing an interesting character it's got richard e grant and sandra bernhardt playing the villains darwin and minerva mayflower who basically steal every scene that they're in you got james coburn playing george kaplan 
a spy who's nostalgic for the Cold War. And that's kind of interesting too, because the name George Kaplan comes from the spy who never really existed in Hitchcock's North by Northwest. So there are lots of these pop cultural and cultural meta-textual bits of information in this film. Some of them dating back to the 1940s, but some of them contemporary to the time as well, which make it a lot of fun. It's not to be taken seriously at all. It's silly. It kind of put a, the brakes on Bruce Willis's career at the time. But this is the Blu-ray from Signal 1. Um, two discs set. I like it. I mean, it's one of those movies that you put on with a bunch of friends who are of a certain age and you all sing Swinging on a Star together while they're riding skateboards through a museum. That's all you need to know. Still watchable, still entertaining, still silly as hell. That brings me to the last one, and this one's from a po problematic movie maker, Luc Besson. And it's based on uh, graphic novels from the 1960s, 1970s, which weren't really popular in English language realms but really popular in francophone ones. Definitely a passion project by Luc Besson. I, I like this movie in spite of the fact that Dane DeHaan and Carla Delvine, who play the heroes, have minimal chemistry, let's just put it that way. But this movie is fantastic in several different ways. Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Now, the first 10 minutes of this movie is one of the best science fiction movies I've ever seen. It shows the future of humanity in space going from the International Space Station forward in a whole bunch of montages, which are terrific. And then it takes you to an alien planet which is devastated by a war it had that the planet and its people have nothing to do with. And it really does take us to really interesting places. Clive Owens in the movie as well, playing the villain. He's neither good nor bad, he's just kind of in the middle there. But the look of this film is fantastic. The technologies involved, the just the, the whole feel of it. And you've got to remember, this is the guy who made The Fifth Element. He knows how to make, how to world build a science fiction movie really well. This one's underestimated, I think. It really does deliver more than you expect. And I think it should have done much better than it did. Yeah, I mean, Luc Besson, again, he's problematic. He's probably not going to do too much else in his career. But if nothing else, watch the first 10 or 15 minutes of this film and you're going to be blown away. And then just watch the rest of it because it's fun. That's the lot. So there's basically 10 movies that are flops. And again, flops are not a kind of criterion by which you should evaluate movies. Whether they're popular or not, depends on a lot of things, whether there was a, a publicity budget, whether the stars cooperated to get a lot of PR done for them, whether the producers and the studios push the movies as well. Every time a movie studio changes ownership or changes management, a whole bunch of really good films that are already made get left by the wayside. All that corporate bullshit, all that money bullshit, is not how you should evaluate your movies. You should evaluate them based on how much they entertain you or make you feel things or educate you or widen your knowledge and appreciation of films. All of those things are important. How much money the people who made it made is not important to you and I. How it makes us feel and how it changes us and how it affects us is what's important. So on that optimistic and terribly cheerful note, Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. You can also support the channel and my addiction to getting these movies by donating just a little bit every month at patreon.com slash paleocinema. Going to be back with more stuff at the end of the week. It should be fun. I've got big deliveries being made by some interesting companies. And so there's going to be some really cool stuff coming in for me to review and to show to you. So anyway, on that note, watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Just take the word flop out of your vocabulary unless you're talking about laying on a couch. And I'll catch you next time.